Welcome to Phylum Cnidaria, or what I like to call Welcome to Phylum Organisms That Can Kill You If You Go Into the Ocean, Part 1. See parts 2 through 1000 in my future videos. Uh, as you can see, I'm from this image or, or series of images. This includes pretty much everything that can sting you found in the ocean, as well as our freshwater organisms as well. So with that word phylum cnidaria, I'm purposely not saying the C. So that C is silent. So you, you can kind of pretend like it doesn't exist and you just pronounce it with cnidaria. This group of organisms includes four different classes found under this phylum. So in the top left, you see class Scyphozoa. This is gonna have all of our typical jellies. Class Cubozoa, uh, this word literally translates to cube-shaped animals. Uh, so it's our jellyfish, but they're cube-shaped. Hydrozoa has a couple different members. You might be familiar with the Portuguese man of war uh, right above my face. And then Hydra, which maybe you've seen, or this way, uh, Hydra, which maybe you've seen in your biology classes. And then we also have class Anthozoa, which contains things like our sea anemones or corals. Now you can watch some different videos that I have that kind of explore these classes individually, but this video is just gonna focus on phylum Cnidaria as a whole. So let's take a look at this phylogenetic tree to kind of root ourselves to where we are when talking about our Cnidarians. So Metazoa is just kind of saying, here's the branch of all of our animal-like organisms. We've already explored sponges that had no tissues, and now we're going into the branch of pretty much every other organism, those that actually have true tissues. And you'll notice that Nidaria is kind of on its own branch by itself. Now this says radiata, this is actually a historic term. Scientists don't really organize, or at least use these words for this organization, but I left it here because it gives a little bit of insight and description into our Nidarians. So our Cnidarians are pretty much, and there's like an asterisk next to that, are pretty much our only organisms that have that radial symmetry. As you learned earlier, radial symmetry has the benefit of being able to sense 360 degrees around you, but it comes with the sacrifice or the loss of speed. It takes a lot of energy to kind of coordinate your entire body to move in a particular direction because you don't have a clear front or back or side to side. So they have radial symmetry. They are also, as you see noted here as well, they are diploblasts or diploblastic. This means they have an endoderm and an ectoderm. They're missing that mesoderm that we see in our triploblasts. This diagram here shows those two layers. So the red layer is that ectoderm, and then the inner layer, that blue layer, is that endoderm. Now you can see it particularly in the Medusa. We'll talk more about that word in a moment. You'll notice like there is a gap. <laughs> like it's not two floating layers of skin, like nothing's in between. There is a jelly-like substance, hence the name jellyfish, that isn't actually a living cell. It's just kind of a protein matrix. So there is something between these two layers, but it's not mesoderm because it's not true living cells. It's, it's just proteins. So good to know, like there is something in between. I don't want you to think, be like, ah, it's a stomach and it's an outside. Therefore, that's it. No, there, there is stuff in between. Now remember, because they're diploblasts, that means we cannot use the terms acelomate, pseudocelomate, or eucelomate. Those terms are exclusively used just for our triploblasts because it's talking about the arrangement of that mesoderm, which our cnidarians lack. And then finally, if we're taking a look at digestion, there's really nothing on this phylogenetic tree too much that kind of lets you know what's going on with digestion. But these guys have incomplete digestion, meaning they only have one opening where food enters and wastes are excreted. And because they only have one opening, that means we cannot use the words protostome or deuterostome because remember those words are used to classify, okay, what form first, the mouth or the anus? Well, in these guys, the mouth and the anus are the same thing. So those are those 
five characteristics that you're going to see a lot in these videos. So we have that radial symmetry, they're diploblasts, they are not a pseudo or eucelomates, they have incomplete digestion, and they are not protosomes or deuterostomes. So kind of lacking in a lot of things, and that's kind of why cnidarians are on their own branch. Now something you notice on this slide, and I mentioned the word medusa, and you can see the other one's called polyp. Let's talk a little bit more about those terms, because you're going to hear those terms a lot as well in the individual class videos. So when we talk about a polyp, you maybe even heard of this term in, in human healthcare. Uh, you can have polyps in your nose or your nasal cavities. You can have polyps in your intestines. It's usually not a good thing in human health, um, but the word polyp is referring to like a form. Um, so we call them polyps in human health because that is kind of what they look like when we're talking about cnidarian polyps. Just very, very different functions. So in our cnidarians, remember these are all stinging things in the ocean. The polyp or, or that form, that body type, is sessile and sessile is just a fancy biology word for saying it doesn't really move i'm going to emphasize it doesn't really move for the most part it's kind of planted on the ground and these guys work like wacky waving inflatable arm flailing tube men and just kind of wave around so they can move and um, they're not like plants and even plants move some so they do have motility but they're usually rooted um, in one spot and and aren't moving from that spot and so cnidarians that show the polyp form what they have is their tentacles are on the top side and they're kind of facing up so physically facing up and that's also where their mouth is. Um, so their mouth is on the top side of the organism and the tentacles and stuff are waving above them. So, you know, looking at this picture, this is a sea anemone. Sea anemones and corals would be a great example of the polyp form within cnidarians. The other form, which is probably something you're familiar with, but maybe didn't know the term, is the medusa form. And this is the mobile or motile form. So this is the one that actually swims. They're not stuck in one place. And they also have a mouth and they also have tentacles. But instead of them facing up, like we see with the polyps, these guys are facing down. Um, so their mouth is underneath and it's surrounded um, by that series of tentacles. Now, when you look at the individual class videos, we'll explore polyp phase and medusa phase a little bit more. But just know that within the classes, some could be all polyps or all medusas or a blend of both. We kind of see both of these pretty frequently, uh, even within classes. So you'll explore more of that in the class videos. The last thing that I want to talk about when we're talking about our cnidarians is a little bit about their anatomy. As I mentioned earlier in the introduction, this is part one of the series of things that can kill you in the ocean. And the reason they can kill you, which again, I really should put a star, they can kill you if you get stung by like an Australian jellyfish. Anywhere else in the world, you're probably fine. Put a star next to that, I am not a doctor. So the most classic characteristic of organisms in Nidarian is their stinging ability. This has direct human health implication. So let's talk just a little bit about how that works. So the only part of a jellyfish that stings you is the tentacles. That's the only place there's these specialized stinging cells. And those stinging cells are called cnidocytes. So if you see this word on a test and you're like, oh my God, I don't remember cnidocytes. Look at that beginning. That beginning, the C-N-I-D-O is kind of like the beginning of cnidarian. So you know, okay, this must apply to jellyfish. So if you're to touch the top of a jellyfish or the body of an anemone, you're fine. Um, those stinging cells aren't there. The tentacles, however, have a lot of the stinging cells. So in this diagram, this is showing an anemone and it does a close up on one of the tentacles. Now the entire tentacle is not made up of stinging cells, but 
a good portion of it is. You'll notice there's regular epidermis cells, and then here's one of those cnidocytes, and epidermis and cnidocyte, etc. So the way a cnidocyte works, let me introduce a second term here, is cnidocytes have a specialized organelle inside of them called a nematocyst. And it's the nematocyst, this organelle, that actually does the singing. So you can only find nematocysts inside a nidocyte, and you can only find nidocytes within the tentacles. Now the nematocysts, what they do is they essentially insert venom into whatever the tentacle has brushed up against, whether that be a predator or prey. This is how they eat too. And when they insert venom, this is what you and I feel as a sting. When you get stung by a jellyfish, that's because a jellyfish just stung you and inserted venom into you. Now, how much venom you get and what kind of venom, aka what species, is going to determine the impacts to you. A lot of jellyfish around the world have minor venoms, um, just in the sense that if you get stung by one, you're probably going to be fine. There are some dangerous ones around the world that will kill you. So this is why I say just avoid going in the ocean, and then you won't get stung. So the way it works, and I'll just kind of briefly go through it, is if you look at this diagram showing these cnidocytes, you notice there's a little protrusion. And that protrusion, they call it a trigger. So you can think of it as a trigger hair. If you lightly brush up against it, that essentially notifies the cell, hey, danger, or hey, there's something there. And that essentially acts as a springboard to shoot out that nematocyst, that organelle that has that venom. And it um, is a, like a long little fiber. And that long little fiber can, depending on what it hits, can um, directly penetrate the prey. It could uh, wrap around the prey or, again, predator too. And then it's going to release that venom. And... If it's prey item, it likely won't kill the prey, but it at least might stun it, make it a lot easier for that jellyfish to consume it. And if it's a predator, right, when you get stung, you're not like, I just got stung. Yeah, let's go find that jellyfish and like eat it now, right? It's meant to be a defense mechanism. You don't want to go back around something that just stung you. Um, I do want to put a caveat because we are talking about jellyfish and anemones and them stinging you. Do not pee on your friends. That will not help. Um, if anything, it will hurt. Uh, if you are at the beach and you have nothing around you, the best recourse is just taking salt water, so ocean water, and kind of flushing it out. Um, you can then use like salt water and sand to kind of make a slurry to help scrape away um, any remaining, essentially nematocysts or nidocytes or, or tentacles but you're going to want to use seawater. Don't pee on your friends. Um, that's the moral of the story of this video. So with that, I mean, that's just a brief introduction to Phylum Cnidaria, but hopefully you appreciate more that if you're going to die from a jellyfish sting, that you know exactly how it works. Something on that last slide that you might have seen popped up is a video from researchers in Australia that are studying um, tentacle stings. And it's really cool and it's a short like two minute video that explains the stinging mechanism a little bit more in depth and shows you about cool research that maybe you'll get involved in. So with that, I hope you enjoyed or not enjoyed learning a little bit more about phylum cnidaria. Check out my other videos that look into the individual specific classes found in this phylum.